everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to cover the basic overview on how to do a structural concept scheme. Structural scheming or concept design is a really, really important part of a project's design and it's probably one of my sort of favourite parts of being a structural engineer. The concept stage is where you, as the engineer, decide on what the structural solution is and it's where you sort of propose different ideas to the client or the architect to sort of help their project development and help their design. From this stage onwards, you have significant influence on a lot of aspects of how the project is run. How well your concept ideas are can sort of determine if the project is going to be successful or not. And this could be like, if it's run on time, financially, is it going to be successful? And that is really exciting. A lot of my projects, which I've schemed at an early stage, don't necessarily change that much once they've um, been built. Well, of course, they go through sort of developed and detailed design but the fundamentals and the principles of what I am showcasing at concept stage doesn't really change and are still applicable. And I think what's really great about the concept stage is with just a pen or pencil, you're able to turn something which is pretty rough and ready at this sort of stage into a real building, which I think is pretty incredible. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see some more content, please consider liking and subscribing and smashing that notification bell. So I think one of the first things you should do before even starting the structural scheme of the building is to check what the ground conditions are. The best case scenario is when you have a phase one or phase two ground investigation report done prior to, to starting your scheme, but sadly this kind of isn't always the case. So if you don't have that information, what can you do? Well, to get a vague understanding of the ground conditions of the site, you can look at geological maps online which tells you sort of, sort of the geology of the site. And if you're lucky, there might be some old historic boreholes which you could look at. So in the UK, we can look at a site called BGS. So if we just type BGS maps into Google, and it's the first link here. Basically, if you can find your site, you can you might be able to find out if you've got any historic boreholes to look at. So I'm just going to punch in a postcode here. Okay, so here's uh, roughly where our site is. And if we tick uh, borehole scans here, and just to zoom in a bit, we can see all of these are existing borehole logs. So if we just zoom in a bit, and let's just pick this point here, and it tells you that there is a scan available to view online. So if we just click it, here is a historic borehole to look at. So if we just zoom in a bit, or maybe not, you can see that sort of the first 500 to 600 mil is just fill. So it's just made ground or just crap ground, which is not suitable for founding on. And then below it, it says that you've got sort of firm to stiff, red, brown, sandy, silty clay with occasional shaley bands and sandstone fragments <clears throat> so this potentially could be used for founding on below this clay you've got some clay with cobbled and boulders so just from this borehole you can probably determine that the clay would probably be okay for founding on it's reasonably deep so it's probably looking at two Two, one and a half to two meters deep or thick the, the sort of clay layer and that's pretty good so you know if I was to do this more thoroughly I'd probably be looking at several boreholes but just from looking at this one you can probably see you can probably assume that the clay would be decent enough ground to sort of found your building on so sort of from this borehole as well you can kind of tell that piled would probably piles would probably be not required because below the clay, you've also got um, a really thick layer of gravel. If there was, say, example, 10 meters worth of made ground or peat, that would probably indicate that you need to go down like a pile, like a piled solution, and not traditional concrete foundation. There are other factors you will need to consider, such as radon, ground gases, or contamination, or whether or not the soil is shrinkable. You only kind of know if the clay is going to be shrinkable once a sort of phase two ground investigation is done, because that's when it will take soil, so, um, soil samples and then run lab tests on it. 
So this is a just a quick um, summary of a ground investigation report. And I advise you don't just look at a summary, you really need to read through it all. But here, if, if the scope of the um, ground investigation was done right, um, they should tell you whether or not the ground is shrinkable or not, or uh, like if it's going to be low, medium or high volume change potential. Other really important things to consider are site constraints around the area which the new building is located. It will be important to check the, le the levels around and you will need to determine if retaining walls will be required. You might want to consider so site access. If access is tight, this might dictate what sort of materials you are able to bring onto site, which might sway your concept solution to favour one material over another. The more information you have prior to starting your structural scheme, um, the better your concept can be. Obviously, not all projects start the same way. Sometimes the client may want a scheme before you get all the information, so you'll be needing to make some reasonable assumptions. Once you obtain more information, such as ground reports, topo surveys, services surveys, etc., then you can start to review and update your scheme as necessary to suit the new information. Right, now we can move on to the good stuff, which is the structural scheme of the building. I'll be doing this in the Concepts app as it makes for a more interesting video and showcases you how you can use your iPad to scheme by hand. If I'm not using my iPad, I'll be probably doing this scheme using Bluebeam or another sort of PDF writer. If you haven't seen my Structural Engineer software video, please check it out afterwards. I've put a link to the video in the description below. If you're enjoying this video, please remember to like and subscribe and smash that notification bell. In this example, I'll be demonstrating the concept scheme of a steel frame structure. I first like to start off by working out a grid system. Without marking on column locations first, I can vaguely work out roughly where I will be needing columns. This band looks quite long, so I will probably try and hide columns within the walls. Okay, I'm obviously cheating a bit here because I've done this markup before. I actually scrapped the old video of me doing it because the table was too shaky and made the footage a little bit hard to watch. Once I've roughly worked out the grid lines, I can start placing columns starting at the ground floor. There are places I'm going to be putting columns which go right through a door, which might seem a bit strange, but I'm going to be highlighting this to the architect and ask if the door can be moved. To keep the structure simple and regular, it is worth asking the question to the architect rather than bending to their design right from the start. If it's say the door can't be moved, then you can come up with a different arrangement, but this is all within design coordination and collaboration, so it's absolutely okay. Once I've got the columns marked on ground floor, I can then copy these columns onto the first floor plan and I do a check to see if all the columns fit and aren't going to be clashing. We ideally want columns to stack all the way through the building and, and avoid having to stop and start columns between floors. We can then move on to framing the floor slab with beams. In the steel frame structure, you're basically connecting columns together in two directions. This is a two-storey sports hall, so you only have beams around the perimeter.
Once I've done the first raw beams, I can copy and paste onto the roof plan. The main difference is I'll be using precast planks at the first floor, which can span up to 8 or 9 metres. Whilst on the roof, I'll be using a metal deck, which won't be able to span as far, so I'll need to introduce some intermediate beams to reduce the span to roughly 5 metres. You must always consider the stability of a structure at concept stage. In this steel frame, I will be trying to utilise cross flat bracing where possible in as many places as I can. It's better to put a little bit more bracing in at this early stage and take it out later, rather than trying to fit it in later once the architectural design has progressed. You might be wondering why I'm not putting in any planned bracing in the roof, and that's because the roof deck I'll be specifying can be designed to act as a horizontal diaphragm which omits the need for roof bracing. I mentioned earlier that the first floor was to be precast planks, so I need to show the span direction of the planks as precast planks are single spanning slabs. I will need to do the same with the structural roof deck, and if you're not planning to use it and instead go with a purlin system, make sure you remember to add plan bracing. It is really important to do a key of some sort. What I like to do is explain what some of my span arrows are. So this brown span arrow, which I've shown everywhere at first floor level, is a 200 thick precast concrete plank. The blue span arrow is a structural metal deck, and I also give an indication on what the typical column size is going to be. I don't give sizes of beams in this area, as I will be noting some of the sizes on the plan itself. I make sure to add a description of what the vertical bracing is going to be, and state what the grade of steel is going to be as well. It is always good to add some notes around a drawing. If I was doing this properly, I would be marking on more sizes, especially around the roof. I would also add a bit more detail for the foundation plan, such as more assumptions and why I think pads would be more applicable to piles which wouldn't be necessary. I state that the foundations are going to be pads, but I'm going to be needing more ground information before I come up with more pad foundation sizes. I also mark on the ground floor that it's going to be a ground bearing slab. So here are a few tips. It's better to over-design or oversize members at this stage. It's always easier to reduce sizes rather than have to make something bigger at a later stage. You have an easier time explaining to the client or the person who's paying for the job why something gets cheaper rather than more expensive. Sketch rough details to go alongside your plan or sketch some sections if the architect hasn't prepared any sections yet. Anything that can help explain your ideas at this stage is gonna be worth it. You should question the architect's design. Remember, design is a collaborative and iterative process and the architect should be expecting comments and questions from you. Okay, so I hope you've enjoyed this video and it's given you a small flavor on how to produce a conceptual design as a structural engineer. There is still a lot of what I haven't shown you because that would just make a video far too long. If you do have any questions though, please drop me a comment and please remember to like and subscribe and see you on the next video. Cheers. Thank you.